Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever and whenever you are. Welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I'm Jeff Rasmussen, your host, broadcasting to you live in beautiful Middleton, Idaho. We've got a very special and very unique opportunity today to hear from one of the leaders in the genealogy industry, the founder and CEO of MyHeritage, Gilad Jaffet, who is live at MyHeritage headquarters in Or Yehuda, Israel. I'm so happy to have him with us today. And I'm also happy to have all of you with us today. More than 1,400 of you from these 24 countries have registered for that live webinar. So thanks, everyone, for sharing part of your day with us. And don't go anywhere after Gilad concludes. Immediately afterwards, I'll have these door prizes to give away. First, we'll have a MyHeritage DNA kit to give away, followed by a one-year full-access membership to MyHeritage with the complete plan. Then I'll have a copy of our Legacy Family Tree software, and finally, a free month's webinar membership. So to be eligible to win, just be here, and that's it. Okay, I'm pleased to welcome for the first time to the show, Gilad Jaffet. I'd like for you to get to know him a little bit. Uh, first, my heritage is the brainchild of the tech veteran and experienced genealogist. His entrepreneurial vision and passion for family history have grown my heritage from a garage startup into a world-leading consumer web company with tens of millions of users around the world. And before founding my heritage, Gilad left his mark at BackWeb Technologies and at BRM Technologies, where his roles as head of product management and leader of the antivirus research unit uh, were instrumental to these companies' successes. And then over the last decade, Gilad has been the driving force behind MyHeritage's mission to make family history easy and accessible for all with a wide range of award-winning products. He has led MyHeritage through significant acquisitions and uh, the forging of partnerships with industry peers. He also invests his own time in various pro bono initiatives, utilizing the technologies and network he's built at MyHeritage for the greater good. Achievements range from tracing hundreds of heirs of stolen properties or looted artworks and providing them an opportunity to reclaim their family's property to personally getting involved to solving genealogical mysteries and reuniting families. It's these activities that have earned him the nickname Sherlock Holmes in the genealogy space. A proud dad of three, Gilad's sense of adventure has led to many trekking expeditions off the beaten track. And whatever you do, don't challenge him to a game of chess. Well, please put together your virtual hands and let's give Gilad Jaffet a nice warm webinar. Welcome. Uh, Gilad, how are you? And welcome to the show. I'm doing extremely well. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, so, so good to have you here. And uh, the screen looks great, Gilad, and so uh, the time's all yours. Thanks again. Okay, thank you, Jeff. I'm very excited and honored to be here. Hello, everyone who is listening. Thank you so much for tuning in. So my name is pronounced Gilad Jaffet. I'm the founder and CEO of MyHeritage. And um, in my talk today, I want to share with you some of my experiences in the fascinating world of genealogy that has been a hobby of mine since the age of 13. One that I've been fortunate to turn into my job in the last 15 years. I'll describe some of my adventures in creating my heritage from scratch. Then I will tell you the story of how I solved a super interesting genealogical mystery that took place in Greece. I see it as one of the highlights of my experiences at my heritage. It is such a heartwarming story about human kindness that I think it deserves to be shared. Next, since my heritage is now the owner of Legacy, and in fact also of this webinar series, I wanted to take the opportunity to let you know what attracted us to Legacy in the first place, how successful the merger has already been so far, and how I see it continuing to thrive going forward. And finally, this is a great opportunity for me to give you some spoilers. I want you to be the first to hear about several new features and products that MyHeritage is currently working on that we're planning to release later this year. All right, let's dive in. I consider MyHeritage to be much more than my job. I really see it as my life's work, and it has filled my life entirely in the past 15 years. Almost every hour of every single day, whether I'm awake or dreaming, I challenge myself to come up with new ideas on how to make it better. 
this is really a passion. To understand it, one needs to go back in time, 35 years ago, to the moment when I fell in love with genealogy. And that moment was in 1983. That's prehistoric. What you are seeing here is my genealogy school project that I submitted at the age of 13. Doing a big project about genealogy in school is mandatory in Israel. I think it's a great thing. But if you don't submit it and pass, you will not be allowed to continue to the next grade in school. Israel is a nation that places huge importance on preserving memories and on genealogy. I'm sure it's because the Jewish people were nearly wiped out in the Holocaust. And most of our families, including my own family, were affected. In this school project, you are supposed to document your family tree as much of it as you can and submit it along with interviews of your family members and stories about your family history. Whereas some of the kids in my class really hated it and saw it as a burden, I fell in love with it. I was supposed to do a short interview with a relative and I chose to interview my mother and I shocked the teacher with a huge interview that described all the main events of her childhood and how it was like to grow up in Israel years before it became an independent state. My mother, and you can see her pictures here, is a professor of Bible. She's now 84 years old, and she had a profound influence on me that drew me to genealogy in the first place. As a small child at family meals, we were never talking about politics or sports, not that I have anything against these fields, but we were always talking about history and archaeology. My mother was not a genealogist, but she got me to be proud and curious about my ancestors. My father was a lawyer and a businessman and a great lover of chess. He always placed huge importance on studying and developing one's intellect. This is the environment in which I grew up to become a genealogist at the young age of 13. And I know you can't read Hebrew, but this is the note that the teacher left on my project, my genealogy project at school. She encouraged me. She wrote that my project is excellent and exemplary, that it should serve as an example for all the children submitting genealogy projects like this one. And maybe she could see the future, that I would one day start my heritage. At this point in life, all the kids in my school moved on, and most of them never touched genealogy again. But I was bitten badly by the bug. And I always felt like I had unfinished business with my genealogy research. I always wanted to go back to it and explore it some more. As you all know, once genealogy is never done, it's never complete. You can always dig deeper in time and discover more ancestors and find their siblings and their descendants. And then you can travel forward in time to discover cousins and second cousins and third cousins that you didn't know before. Almost nothing matches the excitement of finding an ancestor you never knew about before. It's like discovering another piece of yourself for the first time. But my life went on and I had no time for genealogy then. I went to study computer science at Israel's Institute of Technology. That's where this picture comes from. And I studied it for four years while also working full time as a software engineer analyzing thousands of computer viruses and developing solutions against them. It was a very intense period, studying and working full time concurrently, and I was the only one doing it. Uh, what I developed in a small Israeli antivirus company was acquired by Norton Antivirus and later become, became part of Symantec's products. Incidentally, my boss at the time moved from high tech into politics and today he is the mayor of Jerusalem. After graduating, I joined a small startup called Backweb and spent the next four years as a senior software engineer and then a product manager. Now, this is someone who defines the roadmap and features of the product. The CEO of that company, who was the brother of the mayor, invited me to relocate from Israel to the Silicon Valley, where the headquarters was and to be the person serving as the bridge between the business in the US and the engineering back in Israel. This is how I got immersed into US culture. 
I did it and I spent two years living and working in Los Gatos, California. The Israeli company I worked for was successful and it went public on NASDAQ. I was with my girlfriend at the time who came with me from Israel. And she convinced me that it was time for us to go back to Israel and get married and start a family before life got too comfortable for us in the US and we might never return. So in year 2000, we returned to Israel and we got married. Shortly after our honeymoon, I surprised my wife by asking her for her permission for me to take a break from the fast paced career track and take time off for about six months. I was working very hard for almost 10 years by then, all day long and usually all night long. And she said, why not? You deserve a break. So I took the time off and guess what? I dedicated all of it to genealogy. I went to cemeteries hunting for the gravestones of my ancestors. People around me thought I was very strange, but you know that's part of the fun in genealogy. I traveled to meet distant relatives and interviewed them. I bought a special portable scanner and I used it to scan their old photo albums at their homes. And then I asked other relatives about those photos and I got even more information. I was really enjoying myself on cloud nine, but my wife was getting worried because instead of taking a break as I was supposed to do, I was working on my family history even more intensively than ever before, all day and all night, every single day. During this time, I wanted to document my own family tree and I looked for software solutions for that. But I wasn't satisfied with the programs that were available at the time. We're talking about year 2000. They didn't do many of the special things that I wanted to do. Uh, they forced me to build a tree in just one language, but I wanted my family tree to be in both English and Hebrew because I have relatives who speak only one of these languages. I didn't want to build two trees. I wanted to include photos and tag people in them, but the concept of tagging people in photos didn't exist anywhere at the time. The JETCOM format had many limitations and the genealogy software programs of those days were built around the JETCOM format. So nobody really innovated beyond what was um, defined in the format. I wasn't satisfied and as a software engineer, I started coding genealogy software for my own personal use, and I built my own tree on top of it. I called it Family Tree Builder, and it had features that no other software had, such as support for bilingual trees and tagging, and even automatic face detection in photos. It turns out that I was the first to suggest tagging of photos on the internet many, many years before Facebook was created and started doing the same thing. I made many extensions to the JEDCOM format that uh, nobody has done before. But it was year 2000 and I didn't start my heritage yet. I guess I wasn't ready for it. My software really remained as a hobby. I was the only one using it. And for the next two years, I worked as head of product management in two Israeli startups and both of them were a big failure and they got shut down. I was very disappointed and I vowed to never work for someone else again. I didn't want to pay for the mistakes of other bosses. I wanted to be my, my own boss, make my own mistakes perhaps, but be responsible for my own destiny. And this was Israel, startup nation. We all had chutzpah thinking we can all do it. So in the year 2003, I decided to start a new company that will be based on Family Tree Builder the genealogy software that I've been developing for myself and to make my hobby of genealogy into my job. I spoke with my wife and I asked her for a green light to do this because this was going to affect the financials of our young family. I told her that genealogy may not be the best business, that there are no precedents for successful companies with big exits in that field, none whatsoever. But that genealogy is what I love and there are millions of people out there like me who love genealogy. So maybe it can be successful. And I said I will be working from home, that it will probably be a one man company and that I'm going to make a very poor living for us. But she still insisted that I do it. She told me that if this is what I love, then that's what I must do. So one day in 2003, I went to Jerusalem to visit my father who was a lawyer 
he took me to the registrar of companies and together we registered the company. And I named it after my eldest daughter, Inbal. And I called it Inbal Genealogy Technologies. Later, I shortened the name to Inbaltech. And then realizing that it's not a very good name for an international company, I renamed it again to my heritage. My daughter Inbal has never forgiven me about this to this day. She still wishes that the company kept her name. The name of the product was not supposed to be Family Tree Builder. It was supposed to be Heritage with an exclamation mark. The point I had behind it is that genealogy is not what you think. It's exciting, it's technological, it's not old or boring. Here you can see the candidates for the logo in 2003 that were suggested to me by the designers. I picked the logo in the top left, which I hope you are familiar with. We are still using it today, but a few years afterwards we changed its color to orange. Here you can see the first sketch for the website. You can see the name of the company in Bal, and the tagline in the center of the screen summarized what I I felt about genealogy, what it meant for me, and what I was hoping it would become for millions of other people, when a hobby becomes a passion. As an anecdote, the picture there is the wedding photo of my aunt and uncle, and the smaller picture on the box is of my paternal ancestors from Poland. When you start your own genealogy company, one of the perks is that you can use your own family's historical photos everywhere in the design. Nobody even knows that you're doing that. But I, I smiled to myself knowing that I'm giving a special tribute to my ancestors. It was very hard to start a company on my own. I was working from home and I was hoping I could do everything on my own without raising money from others and becoming dependent on investors. This is called a bootstrap and I poured into the company all the savings and money that I had. But I was very ambitious, so I quickly dropped the idea of this being a one-man company, and I recruited a small team. I contacted several talented people who worked with me in previous jobs and who were my friends. One of them is Uri Gonen, who de delivered one of the previous MyHeritage webinars. He joined MyHeritage almost 14 years ago. Uri is amazing, he's productive like 20 people. But I was going broke because I had to pay the salaries of all these people and I couldn't take a salary myself. There's actually no point in paying yourself a salary when you're funding the company because you are paying from your own pockets. And there are so many taxes in Israel. Eventually all my money ran out, all my savings were gone. Everything I had made from the previous company that went public, all gone. And there were still no revenues because I had insisted on a business model called freemium. And that name didn't even exist back then, where everything is free and people pay only for extra features. People around me thought I was crazy, offering genealogy software and a website for free. Nobody else was doing that in genealogy, but I thought it was the right model because the first years would give me strong distribution and the product would go viral. And then once we'd start charging money, we'd already be popular and successful and unstoppable. However, having no revenues meant that money was running out and I still had to pay the bills. I had to take a loan from the bank and they put a lien on our house and car and everything we had. And the money from the loan ran out too. My parents offered to help, but I said no. If I'm going to fail, let it be my own failure. I don't want to destroy the well-being of my entire family along with it. My wife got a bit worried. She was very brave, and she asked me if I knew what I was doing. All our savings were gone, we were deep in debt, and the bank was making phone calls asking how we're going to repay the loan. I told her, don't worry, trust me, I think I know what I'm doing, we'll be okay. At that point, I also dropped the idea of doing a bootstrap and I started searching for investors. But I was a first time entrepreneur with no previous business experience of having my own company. Genealogy was not trendy, it was not sexy. 
Ancestry.com existed, its foundations were created back in 1983, 20 years before I started. It was very popular, but it was not yet known to be a successful business. There were no social networks like Facebook and LinkedIn, so it was impossible for me to explain to potential investors that we would be a kind of Facebook for families and genealogy and family history. All the investors I met said no. I heard more than 30 negatives. I was wasting my time in futile fundraising meetings. The future was not looking good, but I didn't give up. I kept trying, and finally, I found two angel investors who believed in me, Aviv Reis and Yuval Rakavi. Yuval Rakavi worked with me at BRM. That was the antivirus firm, and he was one of the owners. He said, I don't know much about genealogy, but I believe in you, Gilad. Anything you will do is going to be successful. I'm going to support you. Thanks to them, I managed to raise some money, not a lot. Pay back all the loans, and everything was, at that point, back on track. But things were not getting easy, easier. I still had, had very little money and a big vision to fulfill. I wanted to build a family tree of the entire world and be used by people all over the world connecting all the trees. And to do this, I needed technology that can match between the family trees. I just heard of a company that created such technology. They were called Pearl Street Software from Boulder, Colorado. The founder was Cliff Shaw, and the software was called Family Tree Legends. It connected to their website, Gen Circles. Their technology was called Smart Matching, and it was exactly what I needed. Cliff Shaw didn't want to continue that business. He was a serial entrepreneur, and he wanted to move on. He was putting it up for sale as is without a team. I wanted to buy it, but I had almost no money, and I could not afford it. I was meeting then a well-known investor in Israel called Michael Eisenberg. He volunteered to help me as a mentor. In one of our meetings, I told him about this company I wanted to buy for its valuable technology and that I had no money for it. And I also heard that there's another buyer that is about to buy it. My dreams will be over, and I didn't know what to do. He literally kicked me out of the office, and he gave me some of the best business advice I ever got. He said, Gilad, if you want to be a real entrepreneur, you must create the reality that you need. Don't waste time in my office. Leave right now. Drive to the airport immediately with your current clothes. Fly out to this company in Boulder. Once you're on the plane, call them using satellite phone and tell them that you're coming to buy them. Once you have that deal secured, it should be easy for you to raise money from investors in order to complete it. So I did exactly as he suggested. With a few small changes, I passed through home to pack a suitcase first. I had a chicken and egg problem to solve. I needed money to buy the company, and I needed the deal secured so I could raise that company in the first place, raise that money in the first place. But I met Cliff Shaw, and I managed to convince him that I could raise the money, and we negotiated the deal. Then I went back to my investors, and I managed to convince them that I had the deal secured. Both of these initiatives were successful. The money was raised, and I acquired the company. And we added the smart matching technology to my heritage. We even kept the name Smart Matches. We improved the technology over time, and this really helped us achieve our goals. Another important milestone for the company was expanding into historical records. For years, I thought that was too big for me, that we didn't have the expertise to digitize, that it would cost millions of dollars that we didn't have. But in 2011, an opportunity presented itself. A company called Family Link, based in Utah, that operated the website World Vital Records, was for sale. And by sheer luck, its CEO, a great person called Paul Brockbank, had heard of me through some article and about the fact that my heritage had bought a genealogy company before. He was going through a process of selling his company, but the buyer was driving him crazy with an excruciatingly slow process that was taking months while his money was running out. So he contacted me. I was on vacation. 
But to prove to him that I was serious and moved fast, I conducted the review process very quickly. I even found a fax machine late at night at the vacation resort to send him a signed offer. I flew out right afterwards to meet him in a few days. And interestingly, I invented a new business method to negotiate the price for this deal. Because Paul didn't want to tell me his asking price. He was hoping that I would offer more. I didn't want to make an offer, hoping that he would accept less. So each of us kept silent and neither of us would speak up. It was a deadlock. So I offered a way to break this deadlock. I told Paul that we'd find a third party, a shared acquaintance that we both trust that would act as an escrow. I would submit a hidden bid to that escrow, the maximum offer I'm willing to make. And Paul would submit a number the minimum offer he's willing to accept. And we'd have only one go at it, not more, so that none of us would offer too low and then adjust. The escrow would never reveal to any of us what offer we made, the other party made. If my offer would exceed his minimum, the escrow would announce a successful deal and we would meet halfway and that would be the purchase price. So um, Paul accepted and I made my best offer because I wanted the deal and he put a low minimum because he also wanted the deal. And the escrow contacted us and said, gentlemen, congratulations. By luck, my offer was almost exactly the same as the minimum, only a little bit higher. So we set the price in the middle and we were very happy that we had a deal. By acquiring that service, I gained a team in Utah with expertise in historical records production and a very large set of existing historical records. We transferred all the data to MyHeritage and my team built a search engine. And this was our, our entry into historical records, which we grew since then very rapidly to 9 billion historical records that we have today. Other notable steps in our evolution included the first time we digitized a collection ourselves. It was the 1940 US census. And we had done it so fast that we were live with the images before Ancestry and everyone else. There's a well-known blogger called Ancestry, Ancestry Insider. He covered the race of all the vendors to publish the 1940 census and he wrote about us, the My Heritage horse came out of nowhere and beat Ancestry to the race. And this is exactly what they said about us recently describing our strong and rapid appearance on the DNA scene. Then in 2012, we acquired Genie.com and we added them to our portfolio. Because Genie is a single collaborative family tree and my heritage is based on a forest of independent private trees, the models cannot be combined. So we kept Genie separate and independent. The current team at Genie are all from the original days of the acquisition six years ago and they are very happy. Genie is growing and we're all happy. We expanded into DNA in late 2016. Now DNA plays an important role in our company but we are not neglecting genealogy. We treat DNA as a new layer that enhances traditional genealogy, not as a replacement. In 2017, we acquired Legacy, and I will speak about that in detail soon. I could describe the adventures of creating my heritage as a startup from scratch in many more hours. I've told you just the tip of the iceberg. One simply cannot summarize 15 years in 15 minutes but because I have so many other interesting things for this webinar, I will now move on and just share some pictures with you from the journey. I wanted my heritage to be a special company. A special company needs a special office because that's where you start creating the unique culture and DNA of the company. In the village where I live called Bnei Atarot in Israel, there is a beautiful historical estate built by German Templars more than 100 years ago. I had my eye on it and I told the owner many years ago that one day I will start a company will rent his place so he should keep me in mind. That's exactly what I did. It's unusual for a startup company to have its office inside a house like a family. For the employees to have lunch outside on the grass with the chickens around, that was the start of making my heritage into a special company. We expanded in that Templar estate from a team of two people as we were growing. First, First we were on the top floor and the landlord lived below us with his family. Then we asked him to expand 
and he moved out to an old Templar cow shed building on the compound, which he renovated, and we took the bottom floor also. Then we told them we needed the cow shed, and he rented the caravan and moved out there while we expanded. And finally, when there were no less than 70 employees of us in the compound, it was just too small for us, and we had to move out into more conventional offices, which you can see here. We built beautiful offices not far from there and designed them to combine the old with the new. Glass together with old bricks and wood floors. This is exactly what my heritage represents. It's using the most cutting edge technologies of the future to explore the past. Even in the new office, we don't have a reception or a lobby because a family's house doesn't have a lobby. You knock on the door and someone lets you in. But we may finally have to install a lobby now, unfortunately, for security reasons. We have additional offices in California where Genie is and in Utah where our content team is located. And we are hiring extensively. We have a new office in Ukraine that we established one year ago and now has 40 employees as well. Everything we accomplish at MyHeritage is thanks to our wonderful team. And whenever I describe things in the first person, the credit goes to my colleagues. I want to share some photos of my team. This is MyHeritage in its first two years. On the left is Nir Sharoni, who stayed with us for more than 14 years until a few months ago when he left to start his own company. I'm helping them, him and encouraging him. We also did some outsourcing to India in those early years, which was not successful. This was the team a few years later when we had a Purim party at the office. The guy you see on the right is Ran Pellet. He was and still is our chief architect, a very important person in the R&D organization. By 2010, we were a larger team. You can see us in the lawn in front of our Templar office. Standing on the right in a blue shirt, some of you can spot Daniel Horowitz. He's one of our favorite genealogy experts, and he presented an excellent webinar about my heritage very recently. I first met Daniel Horowitz at a Jewish genealogy conference called IAJGS in New York in 2006, and I really liked him. Just like me, he's, a very, he's very passionate about genealogy. He loves nothing more than meeting genealogists and attending genealogy conferences. He could do it all day long. I told him I was going to hire him, that I don't know yet for what role exactly, but we'll figure it out along the way. And since then, he's been with us and very happy. Here you see us in 2011. The occasion was that we decided to give an iPad tablet to every employee as a gift. These devices were new and it was very exciting for the employees to receive them. Fast forward to 2013, we're now raising a toast at the new office with a much larger team. By 2015, we couldn't fit any more inside and we had to take the photo outside with a drone on the balcony. And here is the most recent photo of the team in Israel last month. Now the entire company has 430 employees. And here you see only the folks in Israel. This is a wonderful team. And all these people are here to build great genealogy products for you and support our customers. Here are recent statistics of the company that are rarely shared. In my heritage and Genie together, there are more than 100 million registered users. I'm also sharing here the nice growth of our revenues in the last seven years. As you can see, the last year, 2017, was our best year ever, thanks to the expansion into DNA. You can also see on the bottom right that thanks to our wide international reach and support for languages, we have more subscribers in Europe it's shown in orange in the pie chart than in the United States and Canada. It means that we are really the best place to find European ancestors in all respects, in records, in family trees, and in DNA matches because there are more European users and genealogists than anywhere else. Our DNA database now has 1.4 million people. It's the third largest after Ancestry and 23andMe, but it's growing very fast because we are new to the DNA scene. I would like to share that a few weeks ago, we received a great honor. A book was published in Israel in celebration of the country's 70th anniversary. 
the authors selected what they considered to be the top 70 innovations ever to come out of our country. And we were selected for inclusion in that book, along with a few famous Israeli companies like Waze and Wix. But what I'm most proud of are two things. First, as you can see on the screen, on the website glassdoor.com, MyHeritage is currently the top company in Israel out of more than 3,000 companies in terms of employee ratings and employee satisfaction. This means that we've created a special workplace that hundreds of people not only make a living there to raise their families, but they also come to work every day with a smile and they are motivated about the value that they are creating for the users and the positive change that they're making in the world through genealogy. So even if everything else fails and it all goes downhill, this alone fills me with great satisfaction. But the most important thing in my mind is this. I'm a big believer that every company should not just avoid doing evil, which is the motto of Google, but actually do good. And this is the spirit in which I mentor all the employees at MyHeritage. So I'm most proud of our pro bono projects that take a big part of our activities. In the Tribal Quest project, we are documenting the family histories of remote tribes all over the world that are at risk of extinction. The initiator of that project, Golan, had a brilliant webinar here a few months ago. I really encourage those of you who missed it to go and watch it. And today, I was in a planning meeting ahead of our fourth expedition that is going to consist again of volunteer MyHeritage employees. It will depart in a few more months, and for now, I will keep their destination as a secret. DNA Quest is a more recent pro bono initiative where we are giving away 15,000 DNA kits for free to help adopted people all over the world reunite with their biological family members. <clears throat> the application closed, the applications closed two days ago, and we're now processing the 17,000 applications we received. And almost all of them will receive free DNA kits from us in the next two weeks. I really hope you will change lives for the better when people will successfully reunite with their loved ones that they lost touch with many years ago through these DNA matches. This concludes the part of the webinar about the founding of MyHeritage. I hope I've given you a taste of the history behind the company and its special character. One of the main things that sets us apart from some other big genealogy companies is that we were founded by genealogists for genealogists. I see myself mainly as a genealogist who taught himself by accident to be a businessman and not the other way around. I now want to tell you a very inspiring story of human kindness that is part of a genealogical mystery that I managed to solve. You may ask yourself, does the boss at my heritage really do genealogy and does he have time for it? And the answer is a big yes to both these questions. On this slide, you can see the descendants of a single line of my family tree, my direct paternal line. I researched that line meticulously. It originates from the Ashkenazi Jewish community of Poland. Recently, using DNA, I found the descendants of a lost brother of my great-grandfather. So this chart will grow soon as I finish researching the new path and adding it. The format of this chart is something that I call a sun chart. It is a unique way to display descendants, similar to a fan chart, but it also has photos of each person, which fan charts usually do not have. And it is mathematically optimized to take up the least space possible for the biggest density of people. So you can print it on a small paper or a poster. Anyone at MyHeritage can have this chart generated for any person in their tree, and it's free. Um, I invented this format myself, having been inspired by a similar type Type of genealogy chart that I saw in use by the Jewish community of Corfu in Greece. So this is a computer science rendition of a traditional Jewish chart that has been in use for centuries with the addition of photos and with algorithmic rather than manual preparation. I consider genealogy as a race against time to save memories. Sure, all of us can go over census records and extract information, but these records are usually not perishable. That kind of genealogy research can be done at any time. But the most precious resource for genealogy and the most perishable one are the people, your parents, grandparents, 
the cousins of your parents and so on. I had the luck to start genealogy at the young age of 13 when my parents were still living and my grandparents as well. And yet there are so many questions I wish I had asked them. Many of us start much later when our dearest relatives are no longer alive. So the most important task of a genealogist in my mind is to meet and interview and get to know their elder family members and document their memories while they still can. Every relative who dies takes with them a treasure of memories that is lost forever. That's it. That's why, why, I, that's why I still make it a point personally whenever I can to meet with older family members from my own family, test their DNA, which is very useful with the new chromosome browser and triangulation tools that we have at MyHeritage, and also learn whatever I can from the stories and scan their old family photos. Every weekend when I visit my mother and we have conversations, I record them on my smartphone so that I will have this library of memories forever into the future. The gentleman that you see in the picture on the bottom left with me is my mother's second cousin. She was in touch with him as a child, but contact was lost when his family changed its surname. I managed to find him recently with some detective work, and I met him. His grandfather fled before World War I to avoid being conscripted to the Russian army. He fled from Russia to the city of Harbin in China, where a Jewish community was being established. He was born there in the 1940s and later came to Israel with his mother when his grandfather died. All my ancestors back in Europe corresponded with those relatives in China and they kept all the letters and photos. So when I met him, I was amazed to discover a huge reward and I got access to a treasure of family memories, including this wonderful picture below of my great grandmother whom I've never seen before. And the photo at the top is one I recently found showing my mother's great uncle. It's the one, the guy looking sideways from Poland in 1910. So I do genealogy, but what I like most of all is to take on important genealogical mysteries outside my family that others couldn't solve. This I still do almost every time that one of these mysteries comes my way. And the story I want to tell you now is about one of these mysteries, which I consider as the highlight of my work as a genealogist, and I call it the secret of Erikusa. My first, my story begins with Yvette Corporon Manessis. You see her picture here. She's an Emmy award-winning TV producer living in New York. Her parents were born in Greece, and specifically, her father was born in the tiny island of Erikusa in Greece, which is near Corfu. Erikusa is so small, I've never heard of it before. And here you can see where Erikusa is on the map of Greece. It's a tiny, tiny island. Growing up as a child, Yvette heard a story of bravery that ran in her family, that her grandparents had participated in saving a Jewish family on the island of Erikusa during the Nazi occupation in World War II. In Corfu, there was a Jewish tailor called Savas, and according to the story, the islanders hid him and his three daughters and a very young girl who was their niece for an entire year until the occupation of the Nazis ended. The whole population of the Erikusa Island knew the secret, and at risk of death, nobody told the Nazis and the family survived. This was a miracle. Out of the entire Jewish population of Corfu before World War II, which was about 2,000 people. More than 90% were killed in the Holocaust. And this was a family of five people who were rescued. Yvette wrote a book about this story with fictional characters, but based on the true events. And it's called When the Cypress Whispers. In the past few years, and especially as the book was about to come out, Yvette became intrigued to find out what happened to the Jewish family that survived and to try to find their descendants and meet them. She wanted proof that the story was true. The problem is that after digging and digging and asking questions and even visiting Corfu and having Yvette speak with old survivors of the Holocaust living there and in Israel, all she could find were the first names of the protagonists. 
the tailor was called Savas, and his daughters were called Nina, Spera, and Julia. Their younger niece was called Rosa, and this was the quest. She was looking for Nina, Spera, and little Rosa, because Julia was said to have died in Greece without any children, and Savas himself was said to have died right after the war. The closest Yvette came to finding them was by searching for them on my heritage. In a few minutes, she managed to find a few people who seemed to match. They were from Greece and they had the same names, but it turned out to be a false positive because these names were very common among Jewish people in Greece in that period. So it was a dead end, but it was a good one because through, through that, Yvette got in touch with us at my heritage. I heard from my staff about Yvette and her quest, which at that point had been stuck. And I knew that I had to get involved personally to help. The bravery of the people of Erikusa, as I heard from Yvette, was an amazing story from World War II that was not known. I thought it deserved to be investigated and verified and told to the world. The problem is that I had very little to go by, just the first names of the women. The women were thought to have immigrated to Israel after World War II. In Israel, there is no digitized census and not many public records. It is especially hard to find women because if they came to Israel and got married, they would also change their last name. And even their maiden name was not known for sure. The odds were looking very bad. So this is what I emailed my team. I told them there is so little information to go by that I consider the chances of success to be less than one in a thousand. But a genealogist is like a wolf going hunting and low chances of success only encouraged me and made the challenge more irresistible. So I took on the case and started to work on it all night long, day after day. In very persistent detective work and a stroke of luck, I managed to solve this. I assumed that the women did come to Israel, so it had to be 1946 or 1947, right after World War II. And I looked at all the women who immigrated to Israel around those years, having those first names in all the records that I had at my disposal. There were hundreds of people with these first names, so it seemed impossible to figure out who were the right ones. Remember, I only had first names. My breakthrough was with the first name Spera. I knew that almost nobody goes by that first name in Israel, so I assumed that she must have changed it to a Hebrew name. But to what? I guess that Spera is a nickname for Speranza, which I knew meant hope in Italian. And in Spanish, it is Esperanza. These are the type of things that a genealogist often keeps in their head. And hope is known to me as a genealogist. It's also the meaning of the first name Nadiezda, which who was Stalin's second wife. So. I translated the word hope to Hebrew, and the result is Tikva. And I looked for all women with the first name Tikva from Greece. I had another hunch, which is that Nina and Spera, who were sisters, would come to live in Israel close to each other. So I mapped hundreds of women with those first names, Nina and Tikva, and I tried to find their street address until I found exactly two of them, one Nina and one Tikva, who lived in the same tiny street in Tel Aviv, a few blocks apart. Bingo. I just knew that I found it. And they had the same maiden name, which was Israel. So this is about not losing hope, literally. I researched their families, and I was sorry to find that they had no biological children. But Spera had married a person who had children, and I discovered this by finding her grave. It was on a windy Saturday afternoon that I drove to the cemetery to find the gravestone of Tikva. I knew it was there because the burial company's website had listed it. But that Saturday, due to religious reasons, the website was outrageously shut down, and I had no information on the exact whereabouts of the gravestone. I decided to look for it in the cemetery by going over one by one on thousands of graves. And after a few hours, when I was almost about to give up, I found it. Using the extra information about her husband who was buried next to her, 
I managed to find Tikva's step granddaughter. She was the granddaughter of the husband. Her name was Michelle, living in California. And it turns out that it's a small world. Michelle had been working in the TV industry just like Yvette, and they had many common friends. When I emailed Yvette a summary of all my findings, how I managed to find Spera and Nina and to find a descendant of Spera living in the United States, she wrote back to me an email that is still today one of the most exciting emails I've ever received. She wrote, Dear God, I just read this seven times just to be certain of what I was reading. I cannot believe this. Gilad is a miracle worker. I'm stunned and in shock. It's brilliant, brilliant. Gilad, there's a special place in heaven for you. I'm certain of it. Yvette called the granddaughter Michelle, who confirmed all the details, proving that I had found the right people. But Michelle knew nothing about what happened on Erikusa. But she gave me the details of Rosa, the young girl who was also saved with a family. And it turned out that Rosa had married and she had two descendants. She had two sons living in Israel and they were in their 60s and 50s. I got in touch with them. They were quite suspicious at first because they didn't know me and had no idea what I was talking about. They thought maybe this was some kind of a sting operation. And I bet that happened to some of you when you are contacting people while you're solving a genealogy mystery. But they agreed to meet me and my colleague Aaron at the street outside their house and to let us in only after they checked us out. So they thought we were good people and they invited us, invited us into their house. And it turned out that they never knew this story, that their mother Rosa was so traumatized by the Holocaust that she never spoke about her experiences. She lost her parents and all her brothers and sisters. They knew their mother Rosa survived the war, but they didn't know the circumstances. They knew their mother was from Corfu, but they never heard of Erikusa. But we knew we were in the right place because hanging on the wall in their apartment, we found a large portrait of Savas. And we recognize him by now from photos that Michelle sent us. The two brothers, sons of Rosa, had no idea who this person was, except they knew he was very important to their mother, Rosa. And his picture was hanging right there in their living room. Rosa's sons knew about Spera, Nina, and Julia. Her mom, Rosa, always used to call them her aunts. But we were looking for proof. We were looking some, for some bit of evidence that Rosa acknowledged that she was saved on the island. And the breakthrough came when they suddenly remembered something. Their mother Rosa would never talk about her past, but there was just one time when she did tell the story. She couldn't refuse her granddaughter when the granddaughter did a genealogy school project, just like the one I did at the age of 13. And this happened just a few months before Rosa passed away. The family located the school project that evening and they found a page that described the facts of how their mother Rosa and her three aunts were hidden and saved. And it says, my grandmother and her three aunts were saved from death by good Christians who hid them from the Germans. This closed the circle and the family finally learned about the amazing story of how their mother Rosa and her aunts survived the Nazis. You can see here the response of Abraham, one of Rosa's two sons, when he was interviewed about this story for Israeli television. He said Yvette is like a sister to him. Her family saved his family. And in the family albums of Rosa's sons, we found pictures of Savas and his daughters that Yvette was searching for all these years. Now that we had proof that the people of Erikusa did save this Jewish family, testimony that came from Rosa herself, the Raoul Wallenberg Foundation agreed to award the Erikusa Island their highest award equivalent to the righteous of the nations. These are people who saved Jews during the Holocaust. And the people of the island of Erikusa were to receive special recognition for their bravery in a special ceremony on the island. Yvette and the families from Israel and the United States flew over to attend it. Lots of descendants of Corfu flew over, and I and a bunch of us from my heritage were also invited as guests. 
you can see here the two sons of Rosa, Abraham and Peretz, meeting Yvette for the first time in Corfu, ahead of the ceremony, and Abraham is touching his heart. Savas died right after World War II and was buried in Irikusa by the islanders who hid him and cared for him. His three daughters, before coming to Israel, transferred his bones from Erikusa to Corfu, and he erected a grave for him. And by stroke of luck, it was not destroyed, and we managed to find it. So the sons of Rosa said Kaddish. It's the ancient Jewish prayer for the deceased that you're safe for your parents and your ancestors on the grave of Sabbath. It was extremely emotional. And then came a ceremony on Erikusa that I will never forget. The islanders who were living at the time of World War II and participated in the hiding of the Jewish family were asked to stand up and be honored. There was not a single dry eye in the audience. Everyone cried at the sight of these frail old men and women who stood up now. They were the heroes of Erikusa, just as they stood up against the Nazis and saved this family at risk to their own lives. I'm very proud that I was able to play a role in this amazing story by researching it and solving the mystery and helping it come to light. If you want to read more about it, you're welcome to get Yvette's new book called Something Beautiful Happened. It describes the true events that took place on Corfu and Erikusa and how together we piece together the mystery, along with describing tragic events that took place at Yvette's family along the same time. As you can see, and as all of you already know, genealogy and family history, they're like a detective story, and the truth is always more exciting than any fiction. Research your family history and you never know what you will discover. But this story didn't end here. After the ceremony in Erikusa, I already had a large family tree of the family that started from a bunch of three first names. And I wanted to expand it further. I felt that I had unfinished business with the Jewish community of Corfu. So I visited the archive of Corfu to see if there are any additional records I could use, and I met its head archivist, Nella. I became friends with her and earned her trust because to my surprise, Nella already knew about my heritage and she was using it. When I founded my heritage, I wanted our products to be as international as possible. And I insisted on adding support for Greek as one of the languages. It's an important language of the classics and one that my mother taught me to read when I was a small child. It turns out that my heritage is the only genealogy service that supports Greek. And Nella was using it to create and print large genealogy family tree charts that are hanging right inside the Corfu archive, as you can see in this picture. Nella agreed to help me, and she sent me birth, marriage, and death records that survived in the Corfu archive, which was inside Corfu's old fort. It turned out to my amazement that the archives in Corfu are among the best in Europe because they go back nearly 1,000 years intact and complete. Corfu had always managed to resist invasion and occupation by the Turks. So why Turkey attacked and burned down many other archives across Greece and the rest of Europe, the Corfu archive miraculously survived. Nella gave me records relevant to the Jewish community of Corfu spanning 200 years until the Holocaust when the community was destroyed. Because I can read Greek, I use these records to find the correlation between all Jewish first names and their modern Greek equivalents. This was never researched by any genealogist before. Using the records and other sources, I spent an entire year on this and managed to reconstruct the family trees of almost the entire Jewish community of Corfu. My biggest joy was when I contacted survivors of the Holocaust from Corfu and their descendants living in Israel and presented them a special gift, something they often never knew, their own family tree going back more than 10 generations. One of the people I found through this research was Nata Gatenio, a Holocaust survivor at age 93, who was living on her own in Israel without any family. Through my research, I managed to find her long lost relatives and bring them to meet her and reunite with her once more. So now she could spend the final years of her life surrounded by family. This is one of the unexpected rewards of being a genealogist and one that I'm very proud to have done while still managing the growing company of my heritage.
And now I will move to something totally different, which I promise to cover. This webinar is part of the Legacy Family Tree webinar series, which MyHeritage acquired in August last year. I'm extremely happy with the results of this acquisition. The Legacy team knows this, but it's important that you hear it from me as well. So why did we acquire Legacy and where do we go from here? Here is the list of the nine companies that MyHeritage acquired over the years. The most recent ones are listed at the top. Some of those companies sold to us after they decided to discontinue and they had no staff, and we acquired only their users and data. In some of the other cases, such as Genie and Legacy, the companies were happy to keep going, and we retained their staff and kept them as independent business units. When we acquire a company, we look for high-value complementary services that can give us something we don't already have. We acquire them only if we believe that we can create even more value together than they were able to do before. Most importantly, when we acquire a business that is healthy and successful, we do our best not to ruin it and to let it continue as it did before. Here are the main things that appeal to us the most with legacy. It has, and you, you all know this, it has a passionate team at its helm good people who care about users and who care about genealogy, they have been doing it for longer than we have at MyHeritage. They have earned the trust of the community and we saw the opportunity to learn from them how to do things better, how to handle customers better at MyHeritage. And their feedback has been instrumental to us for improving our products and our support. Legacy managed to build a fantastic and strong community of users. This community congregated around the legacy software and the webinars. We at MyHeritage did not have webinars. Although we do have genealogy software, it wasn't our focus. On the other hand, we had a focus on online trees, historical records, and DNA, and these are completely complementary to legacy. So we thought that the companies would fit each other perfectly. I'm very glad that we reached agreement after Rootstick last year and we closed the merger and announced it in August last year. Here's how we see the future of legacy and we'll start with the webinars. We intend to make the webinar series continue to grow and thrive and become one of the most successful products in the genealogy industry. On our part, we provide Jeff, more resources to improve the webinars, and we promote them to my heritage users to increase the subscriber base. As part of these efforts, I'm happy to announce here for the first time ever, and I have Jeff's permission to do this, two great new webinar features and capabilities that are coming up very soon. The first is closed captions, which means subtitles. This will allow us to promote the webinars to a large non-English speaking audience from my heritage and elsewhere who cares about genealogy education, but until now has not been able to access it because all the content was always in English. The closed captions will also be very useful for English speakers and people hard of hearing who find the subtitles easier to follow along with the audio. And then we will translate them to additional languages. Now users from Germany and France and the Netherlands and many other countries will be able to use these webinars. And if many will come, we will start producing content for them in their native language and maybe add subtitles in English. We are currently adding the closed captions to all the new webinars going forward and also to the most popular webinars retroactively. The next fantastic big announcement is that we've started work on a mobile app for the webinars to allow you to browse the webinar library and watch webinars when you're on the go using your smartphone. This will take longer to develop, but we are very excited to be adding this. The webinars are working extremely well under MyHeritage's management. We moved the servers from Windows to Linux, which scales better, the website is faster, and we took special care not to cause any harm. Jeff has total creative freedom to select speakers and manage the operation. We did not remove or veto any content that covers MyHeritage competitors. We kept everything. We are keeping the webinars neutral and you can continue to find them as an industry-wide resources resource that covers everything in genealogy, whether offered by MyHeritage or not. 
yes, we are adding some more MyHeritage content. As an example is my appearance here. And we are getting very good feedback on some of the new MyHeritage webinars that we've recently done. But we'll always take care not to overdo it, and we will continue to do whatever the community requests. The result of this cooperation has been phenomenal. The webinar business grew in terms of subscribers and revenue in April 2018, 77% year over year, of which 63% is since the merger, far less than a year. This growth is amazing, and it proves that the combination of legacy and my heritage has been a win-win for everyone, to legacy, to my heritage, and to the users. We are very happy with this, and we appreciate that Jeff is doing an awesome job with the webinar, so thank you so much, Jeff. In terms of the legacy genealogy software, I want to emphasize, if you recall, that desktop software for genealogy is how MyHeritage itself got started. I was the one who programmed the early version of our Family Tree Builder software. We respect and deeply understand genealogy software, and we respect the choice of many genealogists to keep using genealogy software, even as many people around us switch to working on mobile apps or websites. Desktop genealogy software offers the best privacy, the most convenient data entry, and often the richest functionality. So for as long as desktop computers are still going to be used and loved by genealogists, we will continue to support desktop genealogy software, both legacy and the MyHeritage one. We won't sell it off and we won't discontinue it, or worse, we won't do both like another major genealogy company recently. Completed. It was important to us to retain the entire legacy team in the merger, from the developers through to each and every customer support representative. We've given them excellent conditions, better than they had before. If anyone will leave in the future, it's because they decided to move on, not because we made them do it. We are very happy that we are approaching the first anniversary of the merger and the entire legacy team is intact. We're also happy that sales of the legacy software are stronger than they have ever been. True to our principles, we're letting Dave Burden and Ken McGuinness continue to run the show, take the product decisions, and keep developing the legacy software. I'm pledging here that we will keep legacy running for as long as we can. This depends on how long Dave, Ken, and the rest of the team will want to keep going. If they are up to it for many years, we will be very happy and give them the best conditions to continue doing it. We will, do my we will do our best, and I will do my best, to keep them happy for many more years, and we're taking off administrative burdens that they handled in the past so they can focus and spend more time on the software development without distractions. In the next version of Legacy, there will be optional tree sync to MyHeritage. It will be off by default. Anybody who is concerned about it, don't worry. It will be off by default. Users who are interested in it will be able to enable it manually. And then they will be able to publish their tree from legacy to my heritage and keep the trees in sync. I think this is a great solution as they will be able to maintain the tree in only one place and it won't grow out of date. They will use the legacy software and yet they will enjoy a lot of extra functionality that MyHeritage offers on the website, such as integration between the tree and DNA kits and the ability to be discovered by distant relatives. Because today, when you have an offline tree on legacy, nobody can discover you. Users who sync will be able to extract content from historical records on MyHeritage into their tree with automatic source citation and a few clicks, and then sync it conveniently into legacy software, saving a lot of manual work. So I'm sure the sync will be a very good idea, but every user will be able to decide if they want to enable it or not. And the default will be to have no sync at all. And if somebody does sync and they don't like it, they'll be able to delete their tree from my heritage themselves at any time. That's it on the bright future of the webinars and legacy. And if there are further actions on this, I'll be happy to answer them soon on the Q&A section of this webinar. Now, I want to say a few things because there have been occasional misunderstanding, misunderstandings about the matching functionality that already exists on Legacy today. When matching from Legacy to MyHeritage takes place, this 
does not publish your tree information to MyHeritage. After matching a person, the data snippet from Legacy is immediately discarded by MyHeritage. If you get matched with a tree on MyHeritage that one of your relatives put there, it's not because information from your Legacy software just leaked out. It means that relative of yours found this information through other means, maybe years ago. And by the way, if this person has you or your family on his tree, he or she is probably related to you. So when you have a match with a tree on MyHeritage and your tree is on legacy software, know that the other user on MyHeritage does not get a match with you. They do not see your legacy tree data. This is one-way matching. If someone already has some of your data on his tree, it came another way. Maybe you posted it on Ancestry.com or MyHeritage, and the other user found the information and copied some of it. So don't get angry at MyHeritage if you have a match and MyHeritage tells you that this data exists in a tree on MyHeritage. If you believe this data should not be on MyHeritage, for example, if you think somebody took it from you without your permission, just contact MyHeritage support and submit a deletion request, and we will remove it even if it's on someone else's tree. If there is offensive content on MyHeritage, our policy is to always remove it. Just remember though, that when someone else has a part of your tree, they are not breaching your copyright because family trees consist of facts and facts cannot be copyrighted. And also remember that genealogy is all about sharing. If all of us kept our tree private and didn't share any of it, genealogy would not be the same, it would be hurt. And many of those offline trees will die one day and will not be perpetuated. As for new features on the legacy software, I'm not the best person to discuss this because I'm letting Dave and Ken run the show. I know that a Mac version is in the works and I know there have been delays, not our fault, because the Mac version utilizes a third party component and its vendor is very difficult to work with but we're doing our best and it will come. And for any feedback, requests and bug reports, keep escalating them to the legacy team and together we'll do our best to handle them. So finally, I don't have much time left, but I wanna take this opportunity to describe very quickly a small number of features that MyHeritage is planning or currently working on that will be released this year. I'm not covering everything. This is just a small taste because we don't want to make life too easy for our competitors and we want to keep some of the positive surprises for the moment we release them. But here are some spoilers. Many of them are described here for the first time ever and I hope that many of you will look forward to these features. I'll start with a fresh new product release from this week. Many users told us that on my heritage they are not big fans of the two-dimensional format of our online family trees and they requested a pedigree view. We listened, although I admit it's long overdue, and we released the pedigree view this week. It looks great and it works wonderfully on desktop and on smartphones. Currently it's in read-only mode, but full editing will be added in the next few weeks. This is very good news for anyone who has used MyHeritage online trees before and didn't like the format. You can toggle between this new pedigree view and the old family view at any time. Next, DNA Quest. I hope many of you have heard about DNA Quest, our pro bono project to reunite adopted people with their biological families using free MyHeritage DNA kits. We pledge to give away 15,000 DNA kits to eligible participants for free. That's worth more than $1 million. We announced it at Rootstick this year and it received a wonderful embrace by the community. The period for applications closed yesterday and I'm happy to announce that we received about 17,000 applications. We've already started the selection process and today we will be sending all the applicants a status update email. In two weeks, we will complete the process and send the 15,000 free DNA kits to everybody who is accepted. I'm really looking forward to this project and helping people find their lost loved ones that they had been looking for their entire life. 
In terms of DNA, we have recently improved our DNA matching considerably. And we added the chromosome browser tools that are among the best in the industry. The accuracy of our DNA matching is now fantastic. But we are aware that our ethnicity estimate results are not great, to say the least. They are currently the weakest part in our DNA offering. We're now working on improving the ethnicity estimates. We are improving the algorithms, aiming to provide better separation between similar ethnic regions, getting to better accuracy based on having much more data and adding more ethnic regions. This much better ethnicity will come out in the next few months, and we will announce it in due course once available. It will provide better results for my Heritage DNA customers and to people who uploaded DNA data to us. We will strive to make these the best ethnicity estimates in the industry, and it will not cost extra money to get the improved ethnicity results for people who already had the results before. One of the key things customers want to find out when they receive a DNA match is how they are related to the other person. Often, we can find clues in family trees of both users. For example, we have a shared ancestral surname feature that lets you know if the ancestors of the two sides of the match have the same surname, which is often a clue as to where the connection is. We are going to add a similar feature of shared ancestral place that will tell users if the family tree of their DNA match has locations that match their own ancestral locations. For example, if you have an ancestor from southern Belgium and your match also has their ancestor from the same location, that could possibly indicate how you are related. And we're going to surface that information to you. So this is an exciting new feature that will enhance DNA matching, and that's about to come out very, very, very soon. We're working on a new feature called Ancestral Birthplaces Chart. It looks at your tree and shows you where your ancestors came from. You can easily enhance the information if you spot missing data, and we'll allow you to access this information for your DNA matches, so you can easily get a good idea on how you're related. This is already working and will be released to the users very, very soon. Now here's a scoop. People who use our search engine, SuperSearch, I'm sure they will be delighted to hear that we're adding a new tabular view that is going to let you view the search results in a much more condensed format when you are searching specific collections. You're gonna get the results in a convenient, dense table, and you'll be able to sort the search results by each of the columns, for example, by first name, last name, or date of birth. Every collection will have its own table. This is going to provide historical records in a more condensed format, so you'll be able to do less scrolling, see more on every screen, and find relevant results faster. As we've announced, we are working on a sync feature between Legacy and MyHeritage that is going to be optional, and it's gonna be in the next version of Legacy. After any sync, we'll let you know what changed on Legacy and was propagated to MyHeritage, and the same in the other direction. So you will have excellent control on what is going on, and you'll be able to view a full report, which is a kind of a change log that will tell you every time what the sync did. The big tree is a fantastic innovation from my heritage, one of our best technologies ever. I described it in detail in my previous webinar, which is called Perspectives on Combining Genealogy and Genetics. So I won't repeat it here. If you are curious to learn more about it, I encourage you to search for my webinar and view it for free. All I will say for now, for the benefit of those who have not heard about it before, is that the big tree is a huge graph that plots all the information on my heritage, all the trees, records, and DNA results in one huge data structure with tens of billions of points. That allows us to find how any two people are connected. That means we can take a DNA match and look for a theory that could explain how these two people are related through a paper trail that consists of family trees and documents using all the trees on my heritage and all the historical records. We will then show you the path and you can use the theory to explore this possible explanation as to how you are related. 
you can see every step in the way. I've tested this on my own DNA matches, and it's amazing. We plot how we are related based on the trees, census records, and other records. I can't wait for all of you to try it once we release it later in the year. So the first feature to use the big tree is called the theory of family relativity. I hope Einstein will forgive me for borrowing his term. And as I said, for more details about this exciting technology, watch my recent webinar that included a chapter about this feature. So thank you. That's all for me, Jeff, and I'm now turning it back to you. Well, Gilad, this was an incredible and emotional journey today for everyone here. There's been times when people have written in saying they're in tears and they've got goosebumps and other times people are writing in in all caps and lots, lots of exclamation points saying how wonderful and Christine writes in saying standing applause and bravo and fantastic. Anyway, uh, the most, <laughs> Gilad, the most enjoyable webinar I've been a part of at last year. Thank you. It, it was that it was for me personally. It was a very difficult, uh, uh, difficult time in my personal life, um, because this was such a uh, such a big uh, decision for us to to uh, to merge to be to be acquired by my heritage and and. Uh, Boy, where I'm at right now, it's it's been the best decision that we've made in our entire lives, and and uh, and and our users. I love our users and our viewers, and uh, they mean so much to me. And you've taken care of them. Ah, anyways, wow. Sorry about that. Those emotions. Um, <laughs> this is amazing. Uh, yes, it really is. Uh, boy, in the comments that are coming in here. I'm going to I'm going to share all of these with you. They're just they're melting my heart here. <laughs> uh, well, th and thank you. Um, I promised all of you that we're going to do uh, we're going to do some door prizes. If I could stop crying. <laughs> uh, OK, um, our, our webinar recording, uh, you'll be able to go on and, and relive every moment of this. I'll have this on later on today and uh, it'll be in the free area indefinitely. Uh, and so please share it with with friends, family, with your genealogy society. Thanks, Corinne, for the big hug here in the chat log. I appreciate that. Uh, so you'll be able to go and, and revisit this again and again and again. Uh, you'll check out what's new in the library. I'd usually spend more time here, uh, but we've got lots, so much good stuff up there recently. And if you want more MyHeritage, uh, here's your direct link. And I have put in your your chat area, the direct links to the webinars that Gilad was referring to on perspectives on combining genealogy and genetics and a couple of others. So those are up there as well. Here's the tribal quest one. Um, okay, and then uh, next Tuesday, we're going to, it will be our next uh, My Heritage webinar, uh, and that will be presented by Mike Mansfield, one of my, one of the key ingredients to, uh, who helped me uh, start my journey here at my, at my heritage. We'll learn about the new uh, school yearbook. So that's coming up. We'll have Cindy Engel next week. Oh, Angela Walton Raji next week. Uh, it just keeps getting better and better. So please uh, tune in early, especially for these last two where there's well over 2000 that have registered for these in advance uh, door prize time. So if you're here, then you're eligible for door prizes. I'm going to go through these really quickly because of time. Uh, first uh, is the MyHeritage DNA test. Uh, of course, you can you can uh, pick your your own up at uh, at MyHeritage. If your uh, raw DNA data is already it's in another service, then uh, then do uh, download it uh, and import it into MyHeritage, and you'll be uh, like I was amazed at uh, the new DNA matches that. Will will come your way. Uh, so our first winner. Now we, as you remember, all uh, webinar subscribers are always entered into uh, one of these door prizes. And so our subscriber that we're going to thank uh, today is Christy uh, Tellen of Ann Arbor, Michigan. And we'll thank uh, Christy with a free My Heritage DNA kit coming your way. So thanks, uh, Christy, for for that. Our next. Uh, our next door prize, and I'm going to turn on your hand raising ability to. Uh, so, if if the My Heritage One Year Complete Plan is something that you'd like to uh, be considered for for a door prize, please look for that 
a little hand raising button. It's in the upper left hand corner of your webinar control panel and, and just give it a click. Uh, but the one year complete plan, this is everything. So uh, all nine billion records, the censuses, record matches, smart matches. And then if you're using the legacy software, you'll get access to all of those matches that legacy is telling you that it has found. Uh, plus it includes, and I, I use this just this last weekend, your own private online tree of unlimited size. I used the, uh, because my tree was there, I used the uh, mobile app. Uh, I was in Lowe's looking for something for the for the house, and my dad calls and says, uh, Jeff, can you find, tell me the name of this one cousin, cousin of mine, and I found it really easily because I had, I had a tree and uh, I had the mobile app. Okay, uh, you've raised your hands. We're going to go. Looks like our winner, uh, Edward, is your first name, your last name, uh, Pirira. Oh, Edward P. So you know who you are. Just watch for an email from us, and we'll uh, we'll get that your way. Uh, next, Legacy Family Tree software. Uh, so I was real happy to hear Gilad talk about the Mac edition there, and uh, because there were lots of questions here in the audience, and we, and we did indeed we had great news this 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 uh, gosh just on. Uh, Tuesday. That's yesterday. Uh, so it's it is uh, in development. We're we're overcoming uh, the the whatever obstacles um, we've been facing. But uh, yeah, thanks t again. Thanks to Gila. That was a I, I loved hearing uh, his perspective on uh, on the software and that it's not, it's not going anywhere. I sure appreciate that. Okay, let's go to let me go and find our winner for this. Keep that hand raised if this is something that you're looking for. And we're going to go to Catherine Gradup. Catherine, thanks for being here and congratulations. Just writing down your names here. And uh, let's go to our last uh, door prize here. So a one month webinar membership. Uh, and look at this, we're almost to our 700th class there in the library. I mean, any anything that you want to know about about genealogy, just head on line and enjoy. Uh, and okay, let's go to let's go to Jerome. Jerome, thanks for being here today. And Jerome, if you've already got a membership, I'll just extend it another month for you. So Jerome Geist. And then uh, everyone, here we go. Here's your coupon code MyHeritage10. Uh, 10 percent off of legacy software a webinar membership anything that we've got up there in the store and that's good through this coming monday uh yeah uh, jerome i do love my career and interesting uh, gilad uh, as you described your history on what led to where you are today uh, i was thinking of how similar our paths were and and how my wife played an incredible role <laughs> in in her support of what i uh, of my passion uh that that was so enjoyable. Well, uh, we've got just a couple of minutes here, and uh, and you've answered most of pe most of the questions that people have uh, asked. But there are a couple. Uh, this one from Alan is interesting. He he says there seems to be a rapid proliferation of DNA and genealogy companies, and he's wondering, do you imagine that the market will support all of them? Do you foresee more more mergers? Alan says Ancestry left a lot of people bewildered when they announced dropping their software and uh, is this is this a similar situation that could occur with legacy so as I explained we will never drop legacy but as to um, what's going to happen with DNA I think that over time we're going to see three companies that are going to be in the lead they're going to be ancestry 23 and me and my heritage and they're going to have large databases with millions of people. Um, there may be GEDmatch and a few independent neutral databases, but there will be a lot of smaller DNA companies that are not going to be successful because they enter the space too late mm. and they will have small databases for matching. So I think at the end of the day, we're going to have three main DNA companies and they are not going to merge. Okay. Well, very interesting. I uh, appreciate the insights. Uh, Joan, now this, this other question, uh, Gila, and then uh, then we'll say goodnight and, and goodbye, but uh, this other question was asked quite often. 
when you when when that time comes and and the ethnicity estimates are dramatically improved like you described uh, how will new users uh, be notified of that will they have to do anything re-upload uh, their data or or what will happen when that time comes this is a wonderful question the way we are going to handle it is that once the new ethnicity algorithms are in place new people getting results will get them directly with a new format in the better accuracy now people who had been tested before and were already delivered their ethnicity results were not going to change them because people freak out when something in their dna suddenly changes on them yeah so in in the settings of the dna ethnicity they will be able to pick between the older algorithm that they have today and the newer one and we will announce to all the users that they can do that hmm. so people will come in and will be able to toggle between old and new and they will be in control great oh, and well. they don't need to, they don't need to upload anything and it will be applied for free on everyone wonderful oh thanks so much for that hey uh Sony, she writes, and I think she summarizes this for everyone. She says, I laughed, I cried, I'm so happy with my heritage. Thank you to both my heritage and legacy. Thanks, Sony, for, for summarizing uh, today for us. Well, Gilad, before we say goodbye, uh, any final thoughts or anything else you'd like to leave us with before we depart? Uh, on a personal note, I have to say it's it's a pleasure working with you, Jeff. Oh. Keep up the awesome work. That's all I can say. Oh, thanks so much. And, uh, you know, I work for you, Gilad, but my respect for you has grown tremendously as a result of this. Uh, what a fun journey. Uh, thanks to you. And uh, and the journey is uh, is fun because of all of you out there, wherever and whenever you are around the world. Thanks, everyone, for sharing part of your day with us. And remember, life is short. Do genealogy first. Bye, everyone. Bye, Gilad. Thanks. Bye.